Welcome back to another episode of The Quirky Inquiry, and I sincerely, sincerely, sincerely apologize for the delaying episode this week. I actually tell you what, I've recorded this exact same episode on Sunday, I believe, on Sunday. But something happened. The room was echoey, and the video quality was crap, based on the crappy lighting situation that I got back there. So when I received the footage on my camera, it looked like basically a film from 1976. So it was grainy, it was dark, it looked like something from from Jason Bourne, and the audio was messed up. So that clip was unusable, so I'm going to record this then again in the professional set, in this entire extravaganza that I got right here, and try to really improve things and try to re-record everything. That's the thing with YouTubers and YouTube content creators is that you have to co you have to be constantly changing your setup, and 9 out of 10 times, your setup fails on you. So therefore, today we're going to talk about something very, 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 very important, which is going to come coming handy in the future of your learning experience, in the future of becoming a renaissance man, you need this thing right here. You need this distinction. And this is the distinction between regurgitative learning and transformative learning. This is such an important distinction that we have to make. And we're going to continue this, to make this in the future as I present you guys with more interesting thoughts and more interesting ideas. More of this is going to make sense the further down the track we go. So I actually started thinking about this topic as I was reading a book by a French existentialist by the name of Jean-Paul Sartre. So Sartre was this existentialist philosopher and he was just wandering around cafes after cafes, you know, writing his book and drinking coffee after coffee and smoking cigar after cigar. But some of his, some of his writings, you have to say that they're pretty darn good. And the one that I read was by the name of Nausea, which is from my understanding, from my understanding at least, it's the first novel that made Sartre into a household name in French existentialist traditions. So therefore I was reading that and there was a very, very interesting character in the book by the name of the autodidact. And if you don't know what autodidact means, search it up on Google. But basically the definition of an autodidact is someone who's self-educated and so someone who's very well read and someone who's well versed in multiple subjects. But from the place of self-education, not from a formal education. So this autodidact in Jean-Paul Sartre's novel, Nausea, he basically committed himself to reading an entire library of books. So he basically is going to go into the library and he's going to pick up a book with the author's name ending with A. And he's going to work through from letter A all the way to letter Z, basically read through an entire library in alphabetical order. So on one hand, I'd take a look at this guy, I was like, oh man, he's uh, exactly what a quirky inquiry should be about. Turning people into that. Reading books after books after books. Like the autodidact. Turning people into autodidacts that buy into the ideologies of autodidacticism. But on the other hand, I started to wonder, does more information in your brain actually make you a better person? Or are we just merely doing mental gymnastics? Are we just merely jerking off in our minds, thinking about molecules and thinking about stuff, whilst we ourselves are not growing as human beings? That got me thinking a little bit. Does eating through an entire library actually make you a better person, or does it just not do anything for you at all? That's when we are transi transitioning into the main crux of today's episode, which is the difference between regurgitative learning or pure information learning, and transformative learning. I'm going to define these terms by using a list of examples here that you can easily attach any, to any experience that you have, and hopefully by the end of this episode, these two concepts are, are going to make some sense for you. Basically, regurgitative learning is the form of learning where you have no deep understanding of the information. So by understanding here, I mean a very specific thing. Understanding doesn't come from you just knowing the thing. I can tell you right now, Jacques Esterida av advocates that there is no the center point of depiction or center point of interpretation of a specific text. I just regurgitated it. Sounds very smart, but I don't understand the damn thing. Nor do you, if you don't, if you haven't read a lot of Derrida, or if you haven't read a lot about uh, this whole movement of postmodernism, you don't understand what the hell I just said. Of course, you can memorize a book full of Shakespearean quotes without really understanding the implications. That's regurgitative learning. 
Examples? Regurgitative learning occurs when you apply a mathematical formula without understanding what the heck it means. I mean, it works well on tests. Give me that question. I know exactly what to do on this question. Let me apply that thing in calculus where you have to switch digits and decrease the power by one. That's the essence of differentiation, right? But why is it like that? Have you not understood it? You're regurgitating. How about in English? When you present it with an essay question, no, nah, huh, uh, what happens when you when power corrupts an, an individual? And now, oh, in your mind, you're turning quotes. You're having the entire structure of an essay. You know, topic sentence, P1, P, P1, P2, P3, conclusion. You have this entire shopping list in your head. And after you walk out of the essay, you're like, oh, what the heck did I write? It's kind of strange that way to think about it. You spent so much time preparing for this essay without really realizing what the heck did I learn besides that bucket list. Oh, well, the bucket list is good enough. Let me just you know, keep it in my, in my pocket and I ace my next essay. So you've learned this bucket list in English without really realizing how exactly to argue for a point. You see the problem here? Your bucket list only applies to a specific situation in a specific novel that you're reading for English. And by the end, you still haven't learned how to argue for a point. That's regurgitative learning. How about in chemistry? The solubility table that you have to memorize? I'm sure most of it are, you know, scientifically proven fact. But why is the case when, that when you add two things together, they tend to precipitate? Why is the case that when you put things together and you rearrange these things together, they turn out to be two radically different looking things? If you don't understand that and you're merely just applying the formulas, applying the rules, applying the acid bases models, you know, I'm, I'm a terrible chemistry student, but I, I don't have much say on the topic. But basically, if you don't understand the essence of why things occur and you're still applying the rules, regurgitative learning. And by far, my favorite, favorite example in regurgitative learning is philosophy. <laughs> you guys all know that I am a pretty avid philosophy reader. I love reading philosophy. Philosophy is my love for life. That whole book bookshelf over there, the bottom compartment is full of philosophy books that I have not had the chance to fully depict. And because philosophy is very hard to read, it actually takes you into multiple layers. You have to understand the historical context, psychological implications, societal implications, historical implications. All that stuff is embedded in one book. So these texts are extremely dense. Sometimes, the introduction is even bigger than the content itself. Ta-da! So therefore, when regurgitative learning gets applied to philosophy, it oversimplifies things. So, when you take a quote by Jean-Paul Sartre, man is what he wills himself to be. Also has a bit of a Nietzschean taste to it. Oh, extreme individuality. And then some people would take that one piece of message and just put it in their head. Oh, Nietzsche said, people out to will themselves to their goals. A man must overcome himself because, you know, most people are not living for themselves. Let me live for myself and let me go become a rebel. So they justify their intellectual position using a very simplified understanding of philosophy without understanding the history, without understanding the societal context, without understanding anything. And they use this intellectual, they use this piece of philosophy as an argument Oh, you shouldn't do that based on uh, morality by St. Augustine. I'm not too deep in the morality of the topic. I'm going to read more about it. But you can see what this entire implication holds to, which is you taking a philosophical position without understanding what the heck the philosopher is talking about. This also applies to postmodernism because I've been reading a lot, of, lot, lot, of, lot about postmodernism and deconstruction lately by Derrida. And deconstruction, if you, if you hear a guy talk about deconstruction, like it's a thing that can be defined. Nine out of ten times, a nine out of ten chances, he's a quack. Because deconstruction and postmodernism are things that refuse to be defined. They don't have a logocentric definition. And logocentrism, I can spend hours talking about logocentrism, but basically, postmodernism is a term that cannot be defined. Nor is deconstruction a term that can be defined. So a lot of people take this philosophical position to go out there and argue with people and that's just a no-go no. You haven't fully understood what the philosopher's talking about, but you're just regurgitating it. 
You're over, 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 overly simplifying the philosopher's contention, which results in a whole big mess. Uh, so therefore, you see regurgitative learning here. You see regurgitative implications here. It's not negative. We're not making a value judgment here. Regurgitative, regurgitative learning has its place. And on that note, let's move on to transformative learning. Definition of transformative learning. Transformative learning is the learning that you take when the piece of information that you've understood so deeply actually transforms how you look at the world, transforms your perception, transforms how you perceive and transforms how you interpret things, and transforms your character and your identity. Let's take the list of examples that we did before and then apply it to transformative learning. First note, mathematics. If you understood an implication of a piece of mathematics so deep and you can fit it into a societal context. For example, you've understood the mechanics of calculus so deep that you can see the gradual implications. You can see how this fits into the real world. You can see how cars run. They can actually, you can actually apply the calculus formula to calculate the exact instantaneous acceleration. When your worldview gets affected, gets infected rather, by this piece of mathematics, when you see the engineer doing his thing, you're like, oh, calculus fits into that. I wonder how, why is that the case? Okay, I've understood this concept so deeply. Now I can actually see this perception, changing my perceptions. That's pretty darn cool. If you can deeply understand mathematics in that way. But for myself, I'm not too big of a math person. So I don't go the extra step. Uh, I stay back in regurgitative learning when it comes down to math. Second example, literature, English. When you fully grasp the essay structure and why is it a case that it is, when you fully see, oh, this is how I argue for a point. Okay, that's kind of cool. Does that mean I can use this English skill that I not got from high school or university and go on to publish a book, publish, publish an article using this exact same structure? Oh, these are literary devices that can actually apply to a whole larger context. And if you read an article from online or from a newspaper, you see this structure happening, you're like, oh, damn, I was never, ever aware of this before. Okay, that's kind of cool. So literature has a vaster implication than just writing an English essay. And it transforms your whole worldview, flips your world upside down. Brilliant. That's kind of cool. Now you have this English skill. You can argue. You can write. You can form arguments. You can really turn yourself into a... You can really transform yourself in the literary sense. Chemistry? It's kind of similar to math, but let me just gloss over it. Once you understood that chemistry so well on theory, and if you observe it in the laboratories, instead of just applying formulas, you, you actually see that thing precipitating in, 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 in a little beaker. When you actually see the implications of the precipitation in chemical reactions, in technology, in engineering, in society and how society advances when you actually connect the dots have you understood the subject so deeply a whole new world opens up and then that's sort of the appeal to learning that i'm advocating here and then lastly my favorite example philosophy once you actually understand a piece of philosophy so deep not just memorizing quotes it literally opens your eye well for me i'm asian i couldn't really open my eye but it literally opens your eyes up to a whole field of possibilities. I'm not kidding. If you read a philosophical text and you understand it so deeply, it's going to leave you jaw dropped. It's going to transform how you look at things because recontextualiz recontextualization is so important. One set of stimulus interpreted in different ways can result in radically different psychological effects. And how do I notice existentialism? Existentialism. I've been reading a lot of existentialism, and really, if you fully understand what the guy is talking about, uh, it really tears your world apart. And some philosophies I recommend that you stay away from, and some other philosophy I recommend that you read more of. Stoic philosophy, for example. It literally opens your world view up. It shifts you between perspectives, and then you can become this perspective ninja, jump from one perspective to the next, to the next, to the next, without getting attached to any of them. And actually, in the future, I'm going to talk about a very important concept, very important Renaissance men's skill of spiral dynamics. You have to understand this model to become a full integrated Renaissance man. So that's in the future, something to be excited for. But philosophy, if you understand something so deeply and it transforms your entire view of the world, that's, that's transformative learning. 
That's what's actually freaking cool about reading philosophy. It's not about, you know, sounding smart and existentialism, man. Uh, existence precedes essence. Sartre argued that man is not that of which he conceives himself to be, but wills himself to be. Sounds kind of cool, makes it sound kind of smart, but at the end, what is it going to do for you? But once you understood it so deeply, and you, when, when your world view changes, oh, holy crap, my world is falling apart. I'm understanding this thing deeper than I ever thought. And then the dots start to connect. Transformative learning. So what's the interplay between the two? How do you reconcile between, reconcile between the two? Because it, it sounds kind of wacky. It sounds kind of messy. Regurgitative. Which one's better? Tell me which one's better. Now you have to be very careful. Because transformative learning in its essence is impossible without regurgitative learning. You have to memorize what the heck this thing is and recall it in memory before you can move on to transformative. Actually deepening your knowledge in this area. So let's come back to the autodidact in the beginning of the episode. The reason why I think the mindset of eating an entire library is not that smart of an idea is that it basically promotes this image of you being that super well-read guy where not much transformative learning had occurred. So what I would argue here is the end goal of all learning, not all of learning, but you can have some facts up there to keep yourself happy. But the end goal of productive learning is at the end to reach this state of perception change, to reach the state of perception change, where your worldview gets blown apart, where everything you've ever knew gets recontextualized, where everything that you wanted to know and the implications of linguistics, implications of history, implications of philosophy, once you memorize it and you deepen that knowledge so much that it reaches a stage of transformative learning, that's, in essence, where the satisfaction of learning coming from. That's, in essence, what becoming a Renaissance man is all about. It's not just about stuffing information in your head. It's all about letting that information percolate through you and then making you into a better person. So, both to learning are important. Don't, let, don't get lost in either or. You need regurgitative learning, of course, to pass your test, but also you need regurgitative learning to get to know the concept in the first place. And after regurgitative learning, don't be afraid to go a step further into transformative learning, where this thing actually transforms how you look at the world. And that's, in a sense, what's really exciting about being a Renaissance man. Da Vinci didn't learn just because he... Oh, anatomy is kind of cool. Let me go, let me go cut open a bunch of bodies. Let me go have a bunch of dead bodies in my basement. He didn't do that. He was actually fascinated, actually excited by the information. And then that understanding transformed him over time and turned him into this Renaissance man, human humanist artist. So that's the distinction. I'm going to be getting out of here. This video is kind of long. And if you stuck through it, it's going to be a pretty valuable episode for you. And in the future, don't be afraid or don't be afraid to stick through longer videos because they're a lot more delicious, a lot more thoughtful, a lot more intentional, so to speak. Take a lot longer to render, but I think it's worth it. I really enjoy doing these longer forms of shows. Anyways, Robin here from the Quirky Inquiry. I'll be signing off right now. Peace out.